It is now my pleasure to present to you Mr. Roshan Paul, who will address the graduates. Mr. Paul is the co-founder and chief executive officer of the Amani Institute, which develops leaders of social change. The Amani Institute was created in part because of what Mr. Paul learned in his previous job, which was working for Ashoka. As many of you know, Ashoka is composed of the largest network of social entrepreneurs worldwide, with nearly 3,000 Ashoka fellows in 70 different countries putting their ideas into practice to solve complex social problems. And as many of you know, USD is an Ashoka changemaker campus. While at Ashoka, Mr. Paul learned that many people who wanted to be social change leaders did not have the kind of a trainer or tools that would allow them to be successful. And so Mr. Paul co-founded the Amani Institute. The Amani Institute proposes a new model of higher education composed of three major elements. First, experiential learning through relevant field placement. Second, training in core practitioner skills. And third, a personal leadership journey which helps students reflect upon their own leadership path and integrate both the field experience and the skill building into a coherent whole picture. The Imani Institute runs its programs in Kenya, where, where Mr. Paul lives, and in Brazil, where Alana Rambat, the other co-founder, lives. Mr. Paul earned his BA in International Relations from Davidson College and a Master's in Public Policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. Please welcome Mr. Paul to the podium. Dear President Lyons, Provost Allen, and thank you for that kind introduction. Families, faculty, staff, guests, and of course, the class of 2015. So class of 2015, I am here to congratulate you and also to warn you. And above all, I am here to urge you to do exactly what it is that I'm going to warn you about. That is, to choose a career of courage. And since courage means of the heart, I mean to choose a career of the heart. Saying class of 2015 reminds me that it was just seven years ago that I sat where you are and watched a celebrity compose herself to speak to my graduating class. In mine, and many of my classmates' minds, lay a slight feeling of having been cheated. The previous year's speaker had been Bill Gates, two years before that, Kofi Annan, then the Secretary General of the UN, and now here we were, facing J.K. Rowling. <laughs> what could the creator of Harry Potter possibly have to share with us, we wondered, us arrogant Harvard kids who were used to having heads of state and global CEOs speak in our classes. So our expectations were pretty low. And then she spoke. To our surprise, we found ourselves nodding along, for she described things that mattered. And soon it went beyond mere nodding, for she touched a deeper vein of truth. And that's my goal here, too. I'd like to illuminate that vein of truth that you've known all along inside you. But I'll happily settle for a few nods, too. Rowling's speech has become one of the iconic commencement speeches. So when I told friends that I had received Dean Cordero's kind invitation, their collective response, if I may summarize, was, wait, so you have to do that thing that Steve Jobs did? Or David Foster Wallace? Or J.K. Rowling? Then they said, yeah, good luck with that. And then they said, it doesn't really matter what you say, just be funny. And since they knew me well, they then added, good luck with that too. <laughs> Another section of my friends provided content suggestions. Here the theme was, hey, can you please define what stay true to yourself really means, because I've never understood what the bleep that's all about. 
sure, commencement speeches have this reputation of being filled with platitudes about pursuing passion and happiness and truth. But when I went back to these great speeches and reread them, yes, dear class of 2015, doing homework never ends, two other themes stood out instead. Everyone remembers Steve Jobs urging us to do what we love, but I bet you don't recall he spent most of that speech talking about death and failure. Likewise, David Foster Wallace urged empathy for the guy in the Hummer who just cut you off in traffic. Rowling spoke about both failure and empathy, first her own life failures, and then the power of human empathy, how ordinary people can be moved to act on behalf of suffering far away in the world. So class of 2015, I am here to promise you a future in which you will know failure, and at the same time to urge you to choose and embrace that failure for the sake of yourself and others. Choose a career of the heart. What these great commencement speeches are really saying is not some nirvana that will come from following your passion. They are telling us that following your passion is in fact really, really hard. You will work your butt off year after year. The hard work you put in to graduate from USD will seem like the old easy days. Moreover, if you are both really lucky and really good, you will fail about half the time, in other words, just as often as you succeed. Nobody I know who has chosen a career of courage hasn't suffered personally in the process. You might get broken by trying to change the world, and you will certainly have to confront whom you really are. At Amani Institute, the organization I co-founded, we call this the inner journey of the change maker. So following your passion is not for the faint of heart. If you're not ready to become the mother of dragons, well, then keep your day job until you are. I bet I'm the only speaker today making a Game of Thrones reference, huh? <laughs> the other side of that coin is that the fulfillment that comes from serving something bigger than yourself which resonates in the social justice work of institutions like this one, lies not actually in reaching the promised land, for even Moses did not make it, but in the struggle of that journey. Talk to people who have done great things, and you will find a nostalgia, not for the award ceremonies and the media headlines, but for the moments of despair, of slogging in the trenches with their particular tribe, the moments when the road ahead seemed steep and likely futile. What you will hear in them is a gratitude for whatever it was that made them go on. I'd like to share two stories from my own career in social entrepreneurship. The first is a story from just across the border in Mexico. But let me start by taking you to a 200-year-old imperial dance hall in central Paris. The walls are covered in red velvet and gold leaves, it's the summer of 2011, and it's a party. A celebration of 30 years of Ashoka, the organization I, where I used to work and where USD currently enjoys the status of Changemaker Campus. It's after midnight, and we're all more than a little bit drunk. A short-haired, middle-aged Mexican woman dances up to me and gives me a big hug. And that was one of the highlights of my professional life. Because in the previous two years, I had spent many hours on the phone with her, helping her think through life and death choices, her life and death. She is a soldier in the long struggle to prevent the trafficking of women and girls, and so she herself lived under constant physical threat. We discussed her limited options to stay safe from the trafficking mafias of Mexico. She described the point-blank assassinations of people she knew the attempts on her own life. We talked about her choices. For example, should she hide from the mafia or go even more public? If she hides and they find her, it would be easy to kill her off in secret. If she went more public, she'd be easier to find, but it raised the stakes of going after her. What should I do, she asked me. I stared into her image on the Skype window my heart full of dread and my mind utterly empty. I had no idea what to tell her. 
As wonderful as it was, therefore, to see her in Paris, to see her so alive and dancing, I also felt impotent because I realized that even though I have had the best possible education, I was unable to help her. And in a career working in social entrepreneurship across five continents, I have come across the sinking feeling over and over. My education had not prepared me for the work I had to do. For, and this is my second story, I have been following my passion since college. I finished undergrad in the recession following the tech crash of the early 2000s. Despite the recession, I was lucky enough to consider an offer from a prestigious consulting firm at a salary a boy who grew up in India didn't really think was possible. Yet, it was also the year of 9-11 and all the violence that ensued, not just here and in the Middle East, but also in my home country of India. I sensed that nothing I would see in the private sector would be anywhere near as challenging and important as spending my time on trying to reduce human violence and suffering. I struggled with the decision. And then, to the concern of friends and family, I turned down the opportunity with the prestigious American company to return to India and work for Ashoka for 10,000 rupees, or $200 a month. I moved to New Delhi, determined to live within my means, to understand what it was to do without. So I took sweaty public buses for hours each day to the office and back, and sometimes skipped dinner, huddled in my tiny room under a blanket for protection from Delhi's biting cold winters, and reading a book until I dozed off, trying not to think of my classmates who had landed wallet-fattening jobs in finance and consulting, who were eating sushi and drinking wine in nice restaurants. You know the picture, the conventional good life. When I did eat, it was often street food, which led to a stomach virus that took years to leave my system. And yet, all through this, I knew that I was still better off than the vast majority of the 12 million people struggling to make a life in Delhi. And all this was still the easy part. In my day-to-day -day job, I found that social change is just really, really hard to make. One of my favorite lines comes from a science fiction novel from the 1960s called Stranger in a Strange Land. A key character says, I used to think that I was serving humanity, and I pleasured in the thought. Then I discovered that humanity doesn't want to be served. On the contrary, it resents any attempt to serve it. Think about that for a moment. The world will resist your attempt to change it. This is why I said earlier that anyone who chooses a career of courage, who tries to change the world, sacrifices something in the process. So after 10 years of working in social entrepreneurship, of supporting some of the most inspiring and courageous people in the world, I finally set off on my own entrepreneurial journey. Our work at Amani Institute is to help those who seek careers of meaning and impact to build the skills and develop the networks and the confidence to move forward boldly. Our larger vision is to help build a world beyond boundaries to transcend the walls between nations and therefore between people, between things like nonprofit and for-profit, between the classroom and society, and most of all, to transcend the boundary between making a living and making a difference. When we are at our best, human beings lead lives that reach our potential to make a difference. What Amani Institute really stands for is being ambitious about the amount of difference each of us can make in the world. I'm here to ask you to look inside yourselves, to identify your ambition for your life at its highest potential, then take a deep breath and wade into the unknown. You won't be alone. When you choose a career of courage, you inspire others to your side. Right through the journey of founding and building Amani Institute, I've had many co-travelers, from the world's greatest co-founder to a global network of advisors, volunteers, and alumni now cheering us on. There is a small but critical footnote to my story that happened right here in USD. 
Long before Amani Institute even had a name, I was here in San Diego on work and through a mutual friend was introduced to Father William Headley, who was then the Dean of the Peace Studies School. Father Headley graciously agreed to meet with me and even more graciously listened to my madcap idea for remaking the Peace Studies degree towards one that in which master's students actually studied in conflict zones. To my great surprise, he said, that's a wonderful idea. Why don't you send me a proposal and come and pitch it to me and my faculty? It's hard to overstate how important this offer was at that time. For someone in his position to take seriously my emerging fragment of an idea was like receiving an espresso shot of pure adrenaline. I left that meeting about two feet taller. Ultimately, the partnership didn't go anywhere, but his words of support at that time enabled a tiny seed to sprout some roots. Thank you. I know you're somewhere in here, Father Headley. We are always impacting each other, often in ways we can never know, crossing boundaries we aren't aware exist. It's why cultivating empathy as a skill is so critical. The good news, class of 2015, is that you have already made a difference. You've already had an impact on others, even if you may not know it yet. And you will continue doing so. There's no doubt about that. I started writing this speech at a secluded camp on the shores of Kenya's Lake Naivasha. It is my favorite spot in the country, a small rickety wooden jetty that extends out into the lake. I was seated on an upturned, broken kayak. In front of me, the lake was calm and stretched for miles towards distant blue-green hills. A large white pelican glided past, steering deftly with webbed feet to avoid the family of hippos breathing loudly underwater, only their snouts and ears visible. High in the sky, the shrill cry of a fish eagle. Behind me, a grove of about 30 yellow acacia trees, each about 50 feet high, entangled at their top, so that the grove had permanent shade. These trees glow, they are so beautiful. Even the most hard-bitten cynic would want to hug them. No wonder that Kenya has been called the paradise section of Africa. I'm honored to give this speech, but more than honored, I'm grateful to have the chance to give it at all. I live in Kenya now, a country of paradoxes. On the one hand, there's terrible crime and terrorism, but on the other hand, Kenya is also one of the most dynamic innovation centers in the world today. A place where you get that feeling over and over to quote a peace song from the 1960s, there's something happening here. It's not just Kenya, of course. Travel to the big emerging market cities of today, Sao Paulo, Istanbul, Bangalore, Shanghai, to name just a few, and you will see the same dynamic of problems and possibility. This is the frontier of where the world is changing. It is a wildly exciting time to be working in these types of places. So I feel lucky in what I do, that I get to work in places like that acacia grove bordering that hippo-filled lake just two hours away from the boom town that is Nairobi. This is one of the upsides of a career of courage. About a year ago, and this is my last story, on Google Chat, I sent a message to a friend describing a dramatic incident that had happened the previous day on a safari walk we had taken with our class. I thought you were out there working, he said, not going on safari. Hey, sometimes I get to go on safari for work, I replied. That is a pretty useful life metric, he said. Happiness is the percentage of time that work equals safari. I'd like to end by wishing that to all of you. When we hear the word safari, we tend to think of the wide open savanna and lions and zebras. But in Swahili, safari simply means journey. My own journey has taught me the fulfillment of committing to a career of courage, that others have already lit the path, that the roadblocks and boundaries we face are often mostly in our own minds and that we can make an impact on others much greater than we imagine. We are all on our own journeys, both out into the world and deeper into ourselves. So we are all, always, on safari. I wish you a very good one. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Paul. The, the University of San Diego will now proceed with the official conferral of degrees.